All right. I can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Great. I I live next to a church and the church bell is going off. So it's like I have the church bell and now I have to start my thanks. All right. Welcome everybody to the product update of uh, May 14th. I think the last one I did was in March. So it's been quite a while. Um, I, I like to shake up a little format a little bit. So this time I figured I would just talk about some things that excite me, which is almost everything we do. So I restricted to a handful of things. Um, and, and, and at the end, I would love to show off a uh, web IDE, which you can all try today, but maybe for one reason or another, you haven't yet. And I would love to show you what's cool about it. Um, so without further ado, oh, I tried to change my slides. Let's try it again. Oh yeah, so first important update. Um, we have a bunch of new team members in the product team. Uh, so we have Andreas, Daniel, Mike, and uh, Vivek. You can find exactly what they're doing in that page that's linked below. Uh, you won't find Mike there, Mike Lewis. He's the manager of the technical writing team, but the other ones are all great product managers of uh, different parts of GitLab. So first thing I wanted to discuss is a GDPR. I've, got the, I've had this question asked a few times, like what are we doing around GDPR? Um, if you don't know what it is, it's a general data protection regulation. It's a regulation by the EU that we all must comply with by May 25th. Um, and what are we doing at GitLab? There's a number of things that we're doing. The main one you will notice soon enough. I think today you'll start to see a pop-up when you sign into GitLab or, um, at one point today, maybe tomorrow, uh, that asks you to accept our terms of service. And everyone has to do that. And what happens is that on May 25th uh, at latest, um, everyone has to be, accept that or else we will start blocking their traffic. And we have to do that, otherwise we face potential very large fines by the EU, 4% of revenue or 20 million euro. So it's quite big. Um, so that's about G GDPR, least exciting thing, least exciting thing of, of today. Um, next up, a very exciting thing, which is already coming in 10.8, is group runners. So you used to be able to connect a, a runner to a specific project, uh, and you can still do that. But group runners allow you to actually connect them to a group. So you, it can be, the runner can be used by all the projects under that group. Uh, super powerful feature. And I think one of those things that's so obvious, uh, everyone is going to, to love this. And then I wanted to highlight a few things. Like, and really, these are just picked from the top of my mind and, and not, not any specific thing specific because you will see the, all the detailed thing in the release post anyway. And the first one I wanted to talk about is roadmap. So, We've had roadmaps in GitLab for quite a while now. Um, it allows you to see all your epics across your group. Now, the thing is with the current version of roadmaps, you can see a small slice of the current time and at the present, which epics are being worked on and which will be worked on in the near future. It's not really useful yet, admittedly, we know that. Um, so Victor had a really good idea, which is, just allowing you to change the scale of roadmaps between quarters, months, and weeks. I think it was Victor and Pedro, um, credit where your credit is due. And suddenly this feature goes from something that is like not super useful to something that is super useful. So in the very near future, you'll be able to see, oh, what are we doing over the next three quarters in terms of epics? So you get a very nice high level overview for a very long period of time. And you can switch, uh, quickly switch to, for instance, months or weeks. Uh, Victor always speaks about this, like different levels of management care about different hierarchies. And um, so one of the things we do is if you select one, we'll remember it and store it in local uh, local storage so that when you return, you see the same queue. I think this is very useful. And I think this is one of those very beautiful things that shows our iterative value. We built roadmaps as it is today. And this is a very small change. Uh, and yet it only opens up a whole world of uh, functionality. So I think it's very cool. The next one is even cooler. So what we saw is that some teams, uh, Tim's team, for instance, the front end team and Sarah's team, UX team, they created uh, spreadsheets to manage their teams. And it's very frustrating if you build a project that you know, is, sh should be used for that, right? Like we build GitLab, you should be able to use GitLab for the things that you're now using a spreadsheet for. Um, so we immediately got to think about how can we solve the problem that uh, Sarah and Tim and maybe others are today solving with spreadsheets. And we thought of the smallest possible iteration, which is the ability to add lists in your issue board that are assigned to a person. So you can now do, you can create a list, for instance, in the example here, a list for Victor. You can say, oh, I only want to see the issues or I want to pin a certain milestone, like you could already do, right? And you can say, oh, 
for 11.0, these are the responsibilities Victor has, and I can just drag in uh, from other columns very easily. So this is a very, again, this is like one of the small iterative changes that opens up a huge world of uh, capabilities. And I was just talking with Victor about also introducing lists for milestones, um, so allowing planning much easier. So I think this is very exciting and this will make it much easier to manage your teams and see what people are working on and, and what they're not working on. Um, and I love the feedback in the comments. Next up, license management. Um, this is one of those things that sounds boring, but it's incredibly useful. So if you have an open source project like ourselves or not, uh, you tend to consume a lot of other open source projects. Uh, they are the dependencies in your project. Basically, if you code anything at all nowadays, you use open source software. Now, every thing that is open source comes with a license. And if you're an organization, you have to think about what that license mean to how, means to how you use that software of that, that particular dependency. For instance, if you have a, a particular sort of copyleft license, you have to also make part of your source code open source, for instance, or you have to always talk about that and make it clear that you're using a particular license or a particular piece of software. Now, this can be a huge headache to companies, especially if you look at projects like GitLab that have 400 dependencies that are open source. So luckily there's tools out there that automate this process. So what they do is they check it all, look at all your dependency and check all the licenses. And then what you can do is you can create a whitelist. Oh, I only want project with these licenses or a blacklist. Oh, never allow things with this kind of license. And uh, so what we're doing with license management, actually we're building this inside of GitLab. Incredibly useful and super relevant, especially to a, you know, an open source organization like ourselves. Um, and I think this is one of those things that if you don't have it, it seems like a lot of work to implement it and most people just ignore it. Um, but if you do have it, it saves you a big headache because at one point in the future, you will have to take care of this as an organization. All right, next thing I'm excited about. Auto DevOps. So you've been hearing about this for a very long time. It will finally be out of beta. It will be generally available with 11.0. Now I'll leave all the details of what that means up to Fabio and the team, uh, but it's, I'm just super proud of everyone that has been working on this and like the enormous potential that it had when we just started on it, that we're finally realizing that the idea that you don't really do anything and you just have an entire pipeline with all these awesome features of GitLab, that's mind blowing. And making that generally available is, is such a milestone, not just like in, in, in the history of, of our company, but in the history of what GitLab is, right? We go from just being a thing with repositories to now being this full-fledged pipeline, going from ID to production and one other thing, and now it's just out of the box and it is no longer a beta feature, very big deal. All right, uh, and then, um, I think the second to last thing, second to last thing is, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. So we, today we have cycle analytics and we have conversational um, development index. We're gonna rename that to DevOps score. And I'm, I'm, I'm working with the team on one, improving these two and two, bringing in this data to everyone. So today it's limited to only the admin screen. So only if you're an admin, you see the DevOps score and you know, cycle analytics are not very good. So don't, not a lot of people look at this. And what we're going to do is one, we're gonna make the DevOps score visible to everyone in the instance. So everyone will be able to see by default how our instance is using particular features and how well we do it. And then we correlate those two. So you could see for instance that, oh, uh, project X, uses more features of GitLab and they have a shorter cycle time and they're doing better or they, you know, we can learn from them. I'm very excited about this and I'm very interested in seeing what kind of potential we can realize by bringing more data to people about like, if you use GitLab in a particular way, this is how it will affect you. And especially once we start sharing that kind of information across instances. So we could, for instance, show you that, oh, customers or other users of GitLab, if they tend to use particular features more and they have a shorter cycle time. It's a very powerful idea and I'm looking forward in like the coming months, coming quarters to explore this more and more uh, and to give more and more data. And I would also love to get any feedback because I know that many of you worked at organizations that build similar kind of tools, um, but often you are restricted in terms of how well you can integrate or whether someone has set up all this integration. The magic is with GitLab, because we have everything, we also have the data everywhere. So it's very easy for us to, easy, relatively easy, to give you insights in how you use different parts and, and how good your tool is and how, you, uh, how long it takes you to do a particular step in a cycle. 
and now onto the web ID. So I know this is a little bit long for a professional group update. So while I'm demoing this, shoot in questions into the chat. I didn't uh, see many questions yet. So I'm just gonna stop sharing this one and share my other screen. All right, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Thank you very much. All right, so what I did is I have here an, a little repository. This is a personal repository of mine um, where I'm building a little to-do app for myself in Vue. And what I did, the only thing I did is I clicked on the web ID button in the repository. And this is what I'm greeted with. So uh, I'm just gonna do the simplest thing possible. I want to open the readme and just make a small change there. Now I can of course here look in the sidebar for readme and it happens to be here in the top level. But what I could also do is I could press command P and then I get to see this. Um, so this is a Fuzzy file finder. Fuzzy file finder was already inside of GitLab. It's kind of hidden. Um, not a lot of people know about it. It's incredibly useful in the setting of an uh, IDE such as this. And what that means is that I can just start typing the file name and it doesn't mean matter if I get the path completely correct or if I get the file name completely correct because this fuzzy, so it will find the file anyway. So let's start typing. Read. Oh, there we, there we have it. Read me. See how cool it is? Maybe if I search for another file like index. It's incredibly fast. Like I, love, I really love this. Um, and this is something that's very normal for IDEs, but for like an, an web IDE such as this, they are often not this good. This one is really good. Um, okay, so I open the README. Let me see what the chat is. So this is command P, yeah. Um, and here I have my README. Now, the next thing I would always do is, you know, make an edit. Um, so let's let's make an edit. Let's say, this is cool. And now what I can do is I can review the change that I made. How cool is that? Right, it shows you immediately on the right side, this is the change that I made. Um, but even further, you could already do this in Web IDE. What you can now do is you can stage the change. So here I see that I have an unstaged change, which is here in the README. And none of my cha uh, uh, changes are staged. So let's stage this one. I can press here or I can double tap it. So I double tapped it. So now I have a staged change here in the README and I see it reflected here as well. What if I wanna do another edit? <laughs> Let's do another edit. So I'm going back to edit and I'm gonna add another line here. So cool. All right, that looks good. Now I can go back, I can review it and I see here on the right side, I see my initial change and I see my new change. The cool thing is if I now go to commit here, I can look at my unstaged change. So you see that actually, let's see, does, does it show me what I want to see? <laughs> yeah, no, it does. <laughs> I find a bug, James. Uh, good thing we're running a release candidate sale. Um, this is this is classic, right? Do live demo, it just fail, but uh, it's, uh, it makes you humble. So I see if I click on my unchanged change, now it shows what it should be showing. Is that on the left, it shows me the state on which on top I was editing. So it already disregards my stage change and it only shows here on the right side my unstaged change. And if I can click on stage changes, you just see that one. So I can see while I'm in the middle of editing, I can see the progression of going from one to the next. Now, this is something you could already do if you had a local editor, but this is not something you could do in GitLab before. And I just think it's super cool. And I'm not even showing you, like, of course you can create a merge request here from, uh, from here, et cetera. Uh, you can even review merge requests in here and edit those, um, but this is just uh, something I wanted to show. This is live now on GitLab.com. You see that I'm just on GitLab. All right, that was it. I'm going to look at the questions. Also feel free to speak up if you have a question. Um, Mark Bell, what edition does license management ship in? I believe it's ultimate, Mark. Um, Fabio can confirm that. Lucas asks, is the license management going multiple levels deep? Um, I think it does. We use License Finder, which is this uh, software that we were already using before. It's made by Pivotal. Um, 
and it checks the source, I believe. Let's see. Joe Miklo says, auto DevOps is better than serverless. <laughs> I think the two are not necessarily replacing the other, but it, it, it sure does make life much easier. Um, Adam Johnson asks, when will DevOps Core be implemented? So the rename is going to land soon. I think it's going to be in 11. Um, but I think we want to make several improvements to it itself, which will be rolling out over the, over the next quarters. Yep. And, and by the way, just a quick heads up on that, Yo, I'll pull you into conversations we're having internally based on meeting the global CIO at uh, Ericsson last week. It's going to be important for us on, on that deal, but I'll walk you through that separately. So Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, as I said, it's, it's really nice to hear these kind of things. And if organizations are interested in these kind of metrics or you have other kind of feedback, ideas, anything whatsoever, uh, let me know. I'll attend every call you invite me to, unless I'm sleeping, but uh, can't help it. I won't be sleeping. Thanks, uh, Adam. Um, Brandon asked, how is the new house? It's very nice. I got these cool lights behind me that I can control by talking to my echo, which is it's very nice. It's a little bit echoey. That's why I set up this mic. I got some, some, some criticisms by Philip about it. Rep says, we should have a button for that. I think he refers to the fuzzy file finder. So people who don't know the magic key sequence can find it. Yeah. Uh, you're completely right. We should. You said it's been there for a while. I never knew it existed for anything. So, <laughs> yeah. So if you have a repository open, so not in a web IE, you press T, just just the button T. There you have your fuzzy file finder. There is a button on the project homepage, but it's a bit cluttered. So I'm working on that as well. Uh, let's see. Gabriel says, does command P not conflict with print? As far as I know, it doesn't. I think you have to implement it yourself for, for each web page. Um, I don't know why create a new branch of merge. I was, was going to say, you know, command, command P is print in on a Mac, but it, it goes to our fuzzy finder on my, on my Mac and Chrome. Yeah, no, it's, a, I mean, it's the same for um, VS code, for instance, it's also command P or it's command shift. No, yeah, it's command P and a command shift P is another one. Um, most of these apps, they have like multiple key bindings to this because different people have different habits. I think on Sublime, it's like shift to command T, I think. You can also speak up if you have a question. Otherwise. Well, when you were listing the, those comment, uh, columns, I put their column should likely indicate which one is staged because it didn't seem to me there was anything on the screen saying, this one is what's in your workspace, and this one is the one that's staged. Maybe I, maybe it was just too small. Yeah, I think it's too small, right? But I can show you that it actually does show you. So you mean the column here on the left? Oh, you mean above them? Yes. I'm not sure which of those is which. They're both slightly different. Then which one have you just modified? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a fair comment. Um, I know that James is in the comments, so I'm sure he's taking note of this. But I agree. Like this left one should say. I don't know. This right one should say unstaged. And this right left one should say staged in this in this case. And if I click on something else, it should change. I think yeah, but also it would make sense to sort of gray out the file you're, or the change version you're looking at right now. Yeah, because right now as it is, you don't see which one you're on really. So it goes along the same lines. Yeah, thanks, Aliran. That's that's a good comment. I I'm not sure if we want to do that, but I, because I believe we want to be able to allow you to still edit it. And if you gray out something, you're basically implying that you can't edit it. Uh, Sorry, wrong it, language. What I meant is um, usually when you like uh, on a tab that you have on your browser, when you know you're on this tab and not another tab, so highlight or whatever in a, in a subtle way highlight which version you're looking at. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Take note, James, take note. Um, one of the favorite things about Web ID is because it's so accessible, everyone has opinions about it, and it makes it so much better. That's why we went really fast in the past few iterations. So this kind of feedback is priceless. Um, Yarek, is it Yarek? I think so. As what is the purpose of creating the IDE? Um, it's, it's very simple. It's very hard to contribute to repositories. If you 
are not someone that has worked with the terminal before and you're asked to make a change to GitLab's website, whew, it's like you have to learn the terminal, you have to learn what dependencies are, you have to install a particular version of a lot of different things. There's a lot of work and it's very complex. And if you just want to edit a single file, you can still sort of do that through GitLab's current editor or the, like the non-web IDE editor. Um, but in all other situations, it's very hard. Uh, and then you have to push from your local terminal. Oh, now you have to set up HTTPS or SSH, which is even worse. Now you have to learn what SSH is. Um, so the threshold to contributing is very high. And our, our motto is that everyone can contribute. So we want to give everyone the capability to actually do this. Uh, and that's why creating something like this is very important. Now, there's a crucial part still missing here. And that is the ability to see a live preview. So you know we have review environments. So we can already spin up um, dynamic environments, basically showing you what the changes that you're making and what we're going to do with Web ID and where we're you know, steadily walking towards is actually having that live preview to the side of it. So rather than you spending hours, sometimes days learning and then setting up a local development environment, you'll just be able to click on the Web ID. It's there. And I think that has an enormous potential to make it much easier to contribute. Uh, and that's what we want. We want everyone to be able to contribute. John Woods says, is there a cheat sheet somewhere with all GitLab shortcut keys? Yes, John. If you are anywhere in GitLab, except the WebID, I don't know if it works there. If you are anywhere in GitLab, you press the question mark sign. So shift, question mark, there is your cheat sheet. Pedro says, is it possible to stage, unstage all changes with one click? Oh, I don't know, is that possible? Yeah, it is, there's a little button. Uh, <laughs> Lyle says, learning about T to open a fuzzy file finder from a project in this call will save me minutes per day, hours per year, thank you. That's very nice to hear. It's also somewhat saddening, right? That means that we haven't taught you well. We're not doing a good job of showing that inside of GitLab. So I think it's a nice challenge to all of us to improve that experience. Like how can we teach people to, um, to learn these kind of shortcuts faster? David Astor, are we thinking about things like go to definition on the ID? Yes, yes. This is something that I've wanted in GitLab for a long time. We explored several different ways of doing this. Um, and there are many different ways. Um, Source Graph does this in a very fancy way for very small set of languages. You can use something like c -text, and it makes it much easier for a lot of languages. Um, but it's definitely something that we are thinking about, but it will, it's still you know, a while away, which is also what James answered. Um, Lucas says the keyboard cheat sheet is broken. If you open it in a large view and oh, great, create an uh, issue, Lucas, and we'll fix it. And Axel says it's fixed on master. So like, we we still have six minutes for questions. So while in the six minutes, I'm gonna just try to demo the cheat sheet. Um, and then if it, if it doesn't work, then we know it's, it's to be fixed. All right, so the idea is, is you can, from any, any page inside of GitLab, you should be able to type the question mark and you should. I'm doing it and it's, oh, and there it is. It doesn't, it's not formatted very nicely. Um, so, but this is it. So the, all I did is uh, question mark on my keyboard. Oh. It doesn't look very good. No. Sorry? Hit show all. Show all. Boop. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, this is not this is not looking very nice. Maybe if I resize it, it will work better. And this brings you back to my days that I did some front end development. <laughs> Luckily we're very talented people at GitLab to solve this. Um, I don't know if it works with command on uh, no that doesn't work. Um, oh yeah, and I, I might as well show the fuzzy file finder. So if you press T, you open up the fuzzy file finder for not in the in the web ID. So you could do the same thing. And if you then press Enter, you just are brought to that specific file. Um, and this is useful as well, right? Like we don't necessarily want the web ID to replace all of GitLab. So we're being very careful about what kind of features it does have and what kind of features it doesn't have. 
um, it's very easy to say we want everything and then we end up implementing everything twice. So we have to be very careful about that. It's it's shift question mark, not command question mark. I don't know, but command question mark doesn't work for me. And uh, Andrea says, we'll take care of giving it some UI love. That's, that's great, that's what I wanna hear. All right, last chance for questions. You can speak up, you can write it. All right. So you you the oh, I hear a question. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that your light is echo uh, controlled. Uh, did you name Alexa Alexa, or does Alexa have another name? <laughs> no, I gave her the name that you mentioned, Lucas. <laughs> I'm one of those uh, echo shows, so I, it's it's really nice because I can I can say, oh, show me this camera, um, and it's because I will install a camera in the baby room, and then I don't need to buy one of those baby monitor systems, but I can just shout at the echo. But I'm always wearing headphones. I never put sound loud, so I, I don't. <laughs> you can shout out the name that you want, uh, and it's not going to make a difference. All right. Thanks, everybody. What's the top feature that's ah. in that's not? Ah, oops, sorry, yo. Good. No, go ahead. What's the next feature for the web ID that you're most excited about that we don't have right now? Um, uh, CI stages is something that we're doing in the very near future and it's uh, incredibly useful. Um, so <laughs> that, that's, that's going to be one. I, I personally, I'm looking forward most to having that live preview in there, right? Like that's, it's not near, near future. Like we are working today on making that possible, but it's still going to be a while because it's a complex problem. But whoa, that's going to be very good. Like once that that's round, like we can all just throw away our MacBooks and just work with Chromebooks. That's <laughs> that's gonna be great. All right, I'm gonna give it three more seconds, and you would have to be very quick anyway. All right, thanks everybody. See you at the team call. <laughs>